Welcome and aloha. Thanks so much for joining us at ThinkTech Hawaii, wherever you may be. Good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening. Good afternoon. And we have the good fortune of having with us today two very, very experienced scholars, researchers, writers, and thinkers on, on the con concept of conflicts in society and how we try and develop rules, including the rule of law, that will lead us toward paths to resolution of those conflicts. We have Professor Emerita Vernilia Randall from the University of Dayton School of Law, Professor Emeritus Ben Davis from the University of Toledo School of Law and still visiting professor at Washington and Lee School of Law. So, <clears throat> Professor Randall, you were talking with us a few minutes ago about <clears throat> some conflicts that are being actually encouraged, invited, and sown in the Florida schools among students. <clears throat> Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Between students and teacher and uh, the Florida Department of Education and the Florida statutes has uh, made it illegal to discuss about race it's in a way that causes people to be upset. So, so if a teacher raises so and and what that means for the teacher is i've been told by at least one teacher that they've been instructed that if they do anything but teach that uh racism stopped in 1964 they potentially invite lawsuits against them as individual teachers as students go home and complain. My view is, is that, that the law is supposed, it attempts to be written in a neutral way. Uh, so it doesn't say which side of race. So my view is if they teach that racism stopped in 1964, kids of, of liberal whites and moderate whites and minorities should complain as well and should file a suit against the teacher as well saying that's I, that makes me feel really bad because it's race it's inaccurate and so i feel bad the 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 law is not focused on my understanding is the law is not focused on the accuracy of the information but how the person feels about what's being taught and and uh my, and it's not just what's being taught, but what's being said. So I yeah. think that that could be uh, that teachers who say stuff in classrooms, uh, you know, that could be used uh, that if to the extent that parents teach their kids that they have a right now not to be emotionally disturbed by what's going on in the classroom that invites conflict and my view is is that we ought to be teaching our children that 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 this shouldn't we shouldn't avoid the conflict by saying well we we don't want to engage in that behavior well that means then the if if we don't teach our kids to engage in that conflict then it means that the people willing to engage in a conflict will win. And so, yeah, our kid, it, 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 I think it, it does promote conflict uh, uh, because it, as I said, it, it tells people their feeling about what's being taught around race mm. is what's important. So, yeah, um... I wish this had been in place when I was in ninth grade. This law would have been great because I, in my world history class in ninth grade, uh, they did the entire history of Africa in the 200 page book. It, it was done in three quarters of a page. And so I said to the teacher, what? The entire history of Africa in three quarters of a page? And she looked at me like, well, you know, this is the book I'm using kind of thing. 
but I would not have felt comfortable then. So I could have maybe raised Kenny, right? Been yes. upset. I was upset at the time. So I could have been upset and have redress, although I wasn't in Florida, right? So yeah, that that that's a, in in Florida. I mean, between the don't say gay law, which is not exactly that, but and the uh, restrictions on what how you can teach and about race, and laws that tell it, it's really interesting to me that the the conservatives have uh, spouted a philosophy for years that they apparently really don't believe in. Okay. Uh, the, like one of the philosophies they have about it is that businesses should be free of government regulation and should be willing to, to make decisions about how their business operate and let the free market control how businesses wash out right. in that free market. I mean, we know the free market is a myth, but that's what they have talked about. But here in Florida, they're perfectly willing. They have passed laws saying that businesses can't require masks, that businesses can't require vaccine, that business, businesses can't require racially equity equitable equity training so that they can't require their employees to go to training on racial equity. It's that that seems so counter to the idea of let businesses make the decision and see how the market responds. Well, you know, what's great with this is that um, literally today, that famous Stop Woke Act, which is saying you can't do that stuff. Um, a U.S. District Judge down there in Florida has given a preliminary injunction to two businesses who said, hey, we want to do our diversity, equity, inclusion training, uh, make it mandatory for our, and this infringes on our ability to do that. And then there are a couple of people who are consultants doing that kind of stuff who also brought a claim they were found to have standing, okay, and the case and the, the court concluded that, you know, that law that Stop Woke Act needed to be stopped. Thank you very much. I'll be here all week because it <laughs> gave it a preliminary injunction uh, because it was clearly not viewpoint neutral. And uh, so, you know, there, there's a little glimmer, at least at the district court level. But I wanted to ask another thing on the teaching side. And you know, one of the most powerful tools of teaching is storytelling, right? Telling a story that the students in the class listen to and think about, you know, of somebody like I went to the women's convention in Houston uh, this past weekend, right? And I was in the transgender, one of the sessions on transgender, and people were telling their stories, right? So here, one story that a woman told is she was a single mother with two kids. And she had a boss who said he'd pay her a dollar more an hour if she wore tight pants and climbed up a certain ladder. And she did it because she needed that extra dollar an hour to feed her kids. Now, is that going to make somebody upset if somebody tells that story? Sure. But is it a good story for you to hear? I think so, to, to give a sense of what could happen. You know what I mean? What, what people have to deal with. And then there was another story, I think it was North Carolina. There was a public school in a very Christian area and four women ran for the top positions in that high school, you know, like the president of the class, vice president, and, and they all four got elected. But the parents got upset because the Bible says that men are supposed to lead women. And so they rescinded the vote. And then the teachers supported all that in that public place, but after there was actually a vote that fall by the teachers and it was a secret ballot. And the teachers supported the women students in the secret ballot when it wasn't out in public and they were kept their position. But this was like a 40 year old woman telling a story about when she was a senior in high school. Is that gonna make somebody upset? It's, 
Absolutely. But is that a powerful story? It was for me. I'm sitting in the room listening to it. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I just, so when we have legislative enactments and school board rules that basically encourage people to generate conflict for the purpose of censorship, to prevent discussion, to prevent exchange of viewpoints and ideas and experiences. How does that square with our entire educational system? Ooh. Well, I mean, it's not inconsistent to tell you the truth in my mind. I mean, it's, I have not known a period in which school boards didn't restrict what information that teachers, and the question is, is what using the power that they restrict uh, to restrict around the discussion of race now, but, but my whole life up until, I mean, the tech, none of the textbooks I had growing up had any discussion of race in them. Uh, Texas has always, uh, Texas and Florida, the, the, the have all, and California, the have not, in different ways. I'm not saying California has done it the same way, but people, textbooks can only have so much information in it. And so they have used the power of their purse in terms of the number of students they serve to control what goes in case books. Uh, and it's been hidden from us essentially. If, if, so the average person thinks there's some kind of objective way that case what goes in the case book is decided. I don't think that has ever been. It's always been what's the political view of the people in control of the students with the most, the student bodies with the most, the school populations with the most students because they are going to buy the most books. And so we've got to be sure that the books conform to their desire. I think what is different in, at least in my lifetime as an adult, I'm not sure that it's different from, from what went on as a child because I, I am cognizant of the fact that Board Brown versus Board of Education came down in 1954 and my school did not integrate until 66, 68 two years after I graduated. So schools were restricting uh, both their students and what their students learn in Texas. That's where I went to school. So I, I, I don't know that I think that this is different in practice. I think it's indifferent in the audaciousness of the explicitness. And it's like, not only are we gonna do it, pass a law so you have to do it uh yeah. because but in i think in without a law every school board newly elected school board can sort of ignores like president executive orders they're good for the time but they don't have any strength for the next president unless they want it school board philosophies and policies are good for the time, but they don't have any weight for the next school board, state school board, municipal, local school board. But by passing a law, it sort of says, okay, you know what? We are going to make it where you, no liberal school board, because that's basically what they're thinking about down here. No liberal school board is going to come in and undo our philosophy of how race ought to be taught with their liberalism. Mm. But the, uh, that gets me thinking about a couple of things. Uh, one was there was a 
documentary by a guy who was a real famous documentarist, I think Fred Weissman, called High School, which was about a suburban white high school in, in like the 50s, right? And the thing about the documentary was how authoritarian the whole experience was for those kids in that school in terms of the absolute almost brutality of the control over them, right? You know, that if you stepped out of line a little bit, right? So it was really a meditation on like, I mean, you know, we talk about a, a autocracy. It was like an autocratic experience as a student at that high school in terms of a learning experience, right? And uh, that got me thinking about students having fear, okay, of speaking up. Because one of the things I learned this past weekend is that in 19 states, corporal punishment is still permitted in school. And, you know, people have their paddles with Dr. Feelgood and all that on it. So that, you know, if you've got a law that's saying you, you feel upset, you can say it. But you've got a teacher that's saying, I got a paddle that says you're not upset. Uh, you know, you can see how it could be a difficult thing for a student. And that's got nothing to do with learning. It's just about control. And uh, the other thing that it bothers me about it is that to the extent you do these limitations, you know, it's dumbing people down. I, I have complained uh, years ago when I was with the Society of American Law Teachers to people at the Department of Education. Uh, why are you all dumbing us down? This is back in the Obama administration. Why are you dumbing down students? I mean, you know, I'm I'm favor of bigger budgets for schools. You know, I have no kids in school anymore. I'm in favor of paying teachers better. I'm in favor of smaller classrooms. All that stuff that if you pay a lot of money, you get as a, a with 15 students in a class or 17 students in a class. I see all those bright eyes and all those little kids, four, five, three years old. And then you watch by the time they get to be 15, 16, 17, and that sort of spirit is kind of gone, you know? And I think there's something wrong with the system that doesn't build and, and build on that spirit as opposed to more crushing it, you know? And that's yeah, what I mean, worries me. The crushing stuff, I mean, unfortunately, the crushing based on the, the school is in full force by fourth grade, okay? And the reason I say that is because based on my study of school discipline and dropout and stuff, kids are being dismissed and 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 they are being sent away from school and not allowed to return in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. By the fourth grade, many students are behind in their reading. And the schools have adopted a passing on philosophy. Uh, and I I went to all the school board meetings in Dayton and I looked at over all of their records, records that was available for everyone. But, you know, unless you go to those meetings, you don't know how important they are. And what they showed was significant portion of fourth graders could not read at the fourth grade level. By the ninth grade, it the majority of the ninth graders could not read at ninth grade level. And by 12th grade, the overwhelming majority of those that were still in school in many of the schools could not read on the 12th grade level, which is, and, and, and in fact, couldn't even read on the ninth grade level. They, you know how they test the scores to say, what level is this 12th grader reading on? It wasn't the ninth grade. Mm. And so then, but these students were being graduated and parents, I thought, were pretty much unaware of how, I mean, how bad their, their child was doing because the grading... <laughs> The grading methodology was set up to hide that. 
And like one of the ways they did that was uh, by not, uh, by requiring teachers to give uh, a certain grade level, no matter how bad the work was. So you couldn't flunk kids. You couldn't give students Fs because if you gave them Fs, they couldn't make it up. And if they didn't make it up, they couldn't they couldn't be promoted. And so you you got to give students that. I mean, that's not <laughs> as an opportunity. They didn't say we want to promote this kid. They basically said, well, we, we want to give students every opportunity to make it up. Right. Knowing that they were never going to make it up because they weren't even reading at the 10th grade level or the 11th grade level. So how are they were going to make up something that they couldn't really read? Uh, right. And uh, and so, yeah, I don't know how I went off on that tangent, but no, it's the, the schools, I mean, the, pro, the schools are failing in so many ways. And it's like so many of our systems, we just build solution. And, and actually, this goes into something I want to talk about because I don't know the answer to this because I haven't read the new law that comes in. Um, the the uh, the big uh, climate change health law. I haven't read it, so I. But my past experience with these kind of laws is they want to adopt colorblind solutions, which meant that by the time they spend all their money, they will not have helped communities as colors as much as right. they've helped white. And sometimes they adopt solutions that are counter to the needs of particular communities of color. So they are made worse. Uh, I think I, I'm particularly thinking of Obama and his housing bailout plan, it actually caught, I mean, it didn't, it was a bad model overall to bail out banks instead of houses. But the idea that banks would pass that money on to, uh, to people who own house would meant that you would allow banks to engage in the racial discrimination that they normally do. And that's exactly what happened. So, yeah. so, so banks didn't do what they were supposed to do, but to the extent they did it, they discriminated largely against uh, black and brown people who didn't, who ended up worse off than they, uh, than they would. So my concern is that if this, and I uh, I haven't read the law, so I don't know. But if there's not an equity office who is involved in all discussions and monitor and developing measurements and having people report those measurements to them on a weekly basis, maybe even a daily basis, and then having programs change how they operate uh, to uh, deal with disproportionate impact or uh, lack of impact on communities of color. What we're gonna spend all this money just to have some study come along and say, oh yeah, black and brown people weren't helped as much. We know but, that's gonna happen, you know. Yeah. Let's well, that's like, up front to change that. Well, it's like uh, those black farmers were supposed to get paid for the discrimination by the Department of Agriculture, and it's focused on their particular horrendous experience with trying to get the agricultural loan, whatever the stuff you do. Um, and, you know, so, yeah, we're going to give some money to them. And then it got, there's a lawsuit brought saying it discriminated against the white farmers, right? And that ends up being blocked. I mean, that's, that's, that's the kind of upside down we live in sometimes uh, right now. And your, your point on the environmental racism being played out is, is well taken. It just reminds me of the GI Bill after World War II where you could get your GI Bill, but it was locally administered and the locally administered being segregated in the South in particular 
You could not go to University of Alabama with that GI Bill. You could go to HBCU, but you you know, or whatever it was, let alone talk about housing and all the other type of things that were there were po conscious policies. So yeah, it's, it's My good dad, old America. Yeah, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, even though he was a veteran of World War II and should have been able to get the GI Bill, GI long, but uh, racial discrimination in the GI Bill was explicit uh, right. in terms of both uh, education and in housing. And then when, which is why when people say, well, there's no, you know, why are you just looking at the past? I'm like, because the past is the future, the present, and in the, we, we should look, we can predict what's going to happen in the future. We don't need to let it happen in the future. But I do know, I, I, I think I agree with, with these conservative Supreme Court they there's no way that they will allow a uh, race based uh equity uh they they're just they're not going to allow it they may not even allow colorblind uh which is developing things that don't explicitly uh look at race but that has the uh has the purpose of measuring and, and, and determining the impact of race so that you don't actually develop programs and procedures that explicitly take into consider race. You just know how different races are being impacted. I suspect that uh, this conservative court may say even that uh, colorblind approach uh, is going to be illegal. And, uh, Chuck, if I could just say something here, sure. which is um, that, you know, part of the idea of the session was, you know, how we do dialogue, right? How do we do dialogue to try to bridge these things? And, you know, it's really complicated uh, because, you know, there is sort of the strategy of sort of calling out things, right? Call out this, call out that. We've seen that all along. And then I heard about a strategy of calling in where you're trying to bring people in, right? Calling in to get to, to build those, those coalitions and things like that. Um, I do think that there is a part played by education, you know, of, of learning things. I certainly, this past weekend at the Women's Conference, learned a lot of stuff that, or became exposed to a lot of stuff that really, I, you know, I've had to think about. But there's one dilemma I have is when you're dealing with folks who are absolutely, basically determined to make you be subjugated. I mean, you know, trying to get them along is like, feels like I'm, I'm, being, I'm being played for a chump, if I could say it like that. And so it's like, I like this one line I heard, which was something along the lines with regards to women's rights, which was that, you take away our rights, we take away your power. You know, that was, I like that line as a way of that moment. So how you take away that power. Sometimes, I don't know how, I mean, I'm not talking about violence, but how you move the system to take away that power from people who are trying to hurt you. That's the thing. I don't know what the answer is, but. And we're already seeing an increasing number of very, very serious conflicts in that area of reproductive rights. Uh, Professor Randall, you're in Florida, where just this past week, a 16-year-old girl with no parents who attempted to exercise the right to establish judicial approval that she had su sufficient maturity to determine that she needed to terminate that pregnancy. She could not take the responsibilities that it would entail, the judge wound up substituting her judgment saying, no, I don't think she's sufficiently mature. And the California, uh, sorry, the Florida appellate court affirmed that. We now have not only executive and legislative mandated coercive 
childbearing, we now have judicially mandated coercive parenting. It's insane. And then what's was insane that it's about that is if if she's sixty years old and not capable, not mature enough to make the decision to have an abortion, she's certainly not mature enough to be to make a decision about adoption, to make a decision about child rearing. I mean, essentially, is the court saying we're going to substitute our value system for yours? We're going, are we going to force you to adopt because we think you're not mature enough? Which I would not be surprised because I, I mean, I would be surprised if they didn't end up taking the child away from her, forcing her to have pregnancy and taking the child away from her as since she's incompetent, too could, incompetent to be a parent. And could I add that there's the trauma of that pregnancy there's the trauma of the kid being taken away. There's all kinds of levels of trauma that are in there that seem to not be sort of important. You know what I mean? It's just insane. I'm just, I don't know. And we see in that situation that if almost anything had been different, if she had had a parent to help make that decision, she would have not faced that obstacle. If the burden of proof imposed on her was not clear and convincing evidence of sufficient maturity, that's not a burden that's imposed on anybody for any other kind of health care decision. Exactly. So we've, exactly. we've now got situations where minority groups tracing the history that you've talked about, Professor Randall, of special interest, influential vocal control groups basically mandating policy by their judgment, their minority judgment, and taking it away from whole sectors of people, women, minorities, youth, others. Yeah, and the, 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 the problem, of course, is that uh, that the local control, in many of these conservative States, the lo the local control list. Uh, you've got uh, conservative governors who are willing to overturn the wheel of less conservative jurisdiction, which is another sort of like because the uh, the you know talking about uh, local control local value decision making obviously only applies as long as a certain viewpoint is in. Right. I, I, I would hope that Democrats would do it differently. Yeah. That is not to try to impose their viewpoint on all of a state. I think that that you know, uh, but I doubt that. I think that the 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 nature of our politics, the nature of how we do things, is we impose our value system on others, uh, and uh, and that's unfortunate. And if any I get... last words as we finish up our time today? Um, well, yes, um, I was just thinking uh, from uh, Professor Randall's comment, the uh, case of the uh, district attorney who said he was not going to uh, do the abortion cases and the governor has uh, suspended him and replaced him and he's brought a lawsuit. And so I think people know that I'm both Christian and a Jew, right? So my, the thought came to me was, look, he fired a Jew. How Christian? <laughs> <laughs> and then on that note, and Professor Randall, thanks so much. For Thank taking you. I'm today. Folks, Thank you for, thanks for joining me. us. Come back again. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Take care. Be well. Be safe. Thank you. You too.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.